Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the last study this week on understanding the lines. Um, before we begin, can we have a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, we are very grateful um, for the time that we have here this morning to open your word together. We're thankful for the light that you have given us. We just pray that we can have clear minds and understanding of these things that we have been studying and that you can guide and direct the study today. That your Holy Spirit can communicate to us the things that are needful and that we can uh, understand them and obey them. We pray that those studying these things um, will be able to share them with others. We pray, Lord, for your movement, for the work that's being done. We ask that we can cooperate with you in all that you are doing. We ask that your Holy Spirit can be here now as we open your word together. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> um, I just want to do uh, a little bit of a review um, So, because I know that we, uh, and I'm going to go back here a little bit. Um, so when we started this study of the lines, uh, we were addressing the much larger structure of, um, of these lines. So we weren't uh, so focused upon the detail that's happening in Right now, we were, we were just looking at these lines as they related to these stories um, in the Old Testament. We started, of course, with creation. Uh, the week of creation gave us this line. And, uh, um, and then I'm just going to these diagrams here. I think I did a lot of lines. Okay. So you may remember this, it was a long time ago. So here we had these series of lines and uh, we had lines, uh, it's not the first one. So here we have this line dealing with creation. Um, and then we had, uh, so that's the, the first seven days of creation. And then we had this cosmic line and, and that just goes from creation uh, to a new heaven and a new earth. And um, in this line, we had this, this way mark, which we called literal Israel. And of course, literal Israel is going to begin um, with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then it's going to go through that entire history um, up to the end of liter literal Israel, which which is, is going to be uh, connected to the cross. So even though we have this way mark here of little, little, little Israel, literal Israel, it's going to connect to uh, the empowerment of that message. And then we're going to have spiritual Israel, Sunday law, history, and then finally the, the new heaven and new earth, the seventh day. Um, and then we put here our line. So um, our line, of course, comes from Millerite history. But you can see that this line's fairly simple in the sense that we have these seven way marks, 1989, 1996, 9-11, 9-11 taking two places, both in the empowerment of the first angel and the arrival of the second. And then uh, the Sunday law, which is the formalization of this second angel's message, the loud cry. And, and we can see here what we were talking about the last couple of days, dealing with the idea that if we looked at Millerite history, this would be Boston and this would be Exeter. So you can see how the Sunday law lines up with Boston. And in our line right now, we haven't come to the Sunday law. So this is the midnight way mark from Millerite history. And, but we have passed um, Raphi and Paneum 
in one line. So, so we know that we have these lines that are, uh, as we zoom into the Sunday lot, we're going to get, um, uh, and, and when we talk about the Sunday law, this is going to be the Sunday law on this line here. Maybe not even this line. Maybe this Sunday law is zoom in. We zoom in, we get Ellen White's line from Millerite history. So this Sunday law can serve different uh, way marks on different lines. And uh, then we have here the cosmic line. We have literal Israel. And so one of the things we see in little, literal Israel, we have this Egypt to Canaan. And, and in this line, but where's the judges? So that literal Israel line, uh, why don't we have the period of the judges here as a way mark or even mentioned? Anybody know why? Because we got Israel's 12 sons. You're going to have Egypt to Canaan. And then we put uh, 1097. That's going to be the anointing of Saul. So, so we have this whole history. Once they enter into the promised land. Um, till Saul, which is we call the period of the judges. We don't have it here at all. And why, why did we do that? Why did we just forget about the period of the judges? I mean, should we have shouldn't we have the period of the judges in here somewhere? And, and if you think about this, this is Israel's 12 sons, right? Israel's 12 sons, that's obviously going to be uh, that first way mark. That's the arrival of the first angel. Um, but they're going to go into Egypt. Um, and so that period from Egypt to Canaan, that's uh, a history that we're, we have as uh, the formalization of a message. And then we put 1097 BC, that's the anointing of Saul as the empowerment and the anointing of Saul is uh, when they have a king. And so we're putting that the empowerment of Israel's 12 sons. And, and then we're going to have uh, 977 BC when the kingdom is divided as the arrival of the second angel. And then we have 742 BC as the formalization Right, so this is when the kingdom is divided, um, and then it's going to have this prophecy that's going to lead. To, it's starting to be fulfilled, but it's going to be the two twenty-five twenties, right? Uh, that it's going to start for spiritual Israel, but for literal Israel, it's going to be the periods of uh, seventy years that are going to begin. And then you're going to have the three decrees, which is uh, a reform line in and of itself, as we know. But that's going to be the second angel empowered. And then it's going to bring us up to Christ and his disciples as the third angel's message arriving. So why don't we put the period of the judges in here somewhere? Can you make a case why we shouldn't have the period of judges in this history?
Okay, so Iran says a smaller line. Okay, so so that if we're taking it that way, we we could say that the period of the judges is just to zoom into a way mark on one of these other lines. So if that was the case, where would the zoom in be? So I think the judges would be on one one AF, Egypt to Canaan. Okay. When they arrived in Canaan. So it would be uh, a zoom into uh, the history of Canaan. Um, okay. Well, that that's a possibility. Um, now, one of the things things it talks about in the book of Judges because um, in, in trying to put this on a line we're going to have this um, this statement and you're going to see this in like Judges 16 verse 7 in those days there was no king in Israel but every man did that which was right in his own eyes Um, so what is that, what information is that giving us about the period of the judges? Now, could we look at the period of judges, even though we have all of these reform lines in there, and I'm not saying the reform lines don't belong, but isn't the period of judges a period of darkness in and of itself? Because as we've put judges on a line, what we have done is we've looked at each of these different chapters and put them on a line. So we have these reform lines that exist within the period of judges. But the period of judges overall is, um, remember when we have a progressive dis destruction of four, what happens in the first generation? So after they get into Egypt, they have this reform line. And then they're going to have this falling away, right? And it happens in a series of a progression that we that happens in four stages, right? Isn't that how we understand what happens before a reform line? And in the fourth generation, of course, you have a period of darkness. But it's progressing all the way through. Because I think one of the things we have to do with the book of Judges is we have to address what the book of Judges is. And I'm saying that I, I believe it's a progressive destruction of four. And that, that the period of Judges is going to lead to a reform line. And, and where will the reform line begin in the period of Judges? At the end of the period of Judges, where does the reform begin? I mean, we have lots of reformers, so to speak, in each of these histories, but who would be the reformer that marks the time of the end? And especially if you look at that literal line of Israel, you're going to see 1097 when Saul's anointed. Um, so there is a reform line there. Who's going to start that reform line? So Dwight, I know you came in a little bit late, but um, 
what we're doing is we're looking at how we have this line of literal Israel and we don't have judges on this line. Oh, I see that. And and I was asking why we don't. And my suggestion is that the period of judges is a progressive progressive destruction of four that precedes a reform line. And of course, that's going to occur in that history um, between their arrival to the promised land and the anointing of Saul. And we know in chapter 17, it talks about, uh, uh, and in chapter 21, there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. And, and that this is uh, talking about the period of the judges prior to them having a king. And of course, even though them having a king wasn't something God wanted, he was to be their king. We can see that it's part of a reform line for literal Israel. But we have these all of these steps that we've placed there. And the question is, are we correct in not putting judges as one of those? And when I asked, you know, why don't we have judges? One suggestion was is that we're zoomed into judges is a zoom into another reform line, which I think is partly correct. But I also think it's just that it's the period of the progressive destruction of four of the four generations. Doesn't mean you don't have reform lines in a progressive destruction of four, because you do. You have reformers, but it's still going downhill to some degree until there's a reform line. And when you know, when we get to 1097, we're going to have a Saul anointed, but we know that that's going to lead to this Saul, David, and Solomon, right? And then the building of the temple. And we, we look at that as the three angels' messages. So in understanding these structures of these reform lines, as we've been going through Judges, we've been taking each of these stories and we've been creating these reform lines that relate to our history, but we haven't taken the story of Judges and placed it in this larger context. I just find the way that you've presented the lines to be interesting in having um, literal Israel between the cosmic line and Canaan. Um, no, it's a presentation yeah. situation. Yeah, yeah, I understand what you're saying. Yeah, because, well, this is one one of the pages that we did when we drew out these lines. So when we drew them out, we were... Um, we dealt with literal Israel, and then we zoomed in to Canaan because we're going to deal with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And that's going to be um, that's going to be uh, Canaan itself, uh, leading up to Jacob, and that's going to be a zoom into uh, the first angel arriving with Israel's twelve sons. So that's going to be. Yeah, you know, so that's why I put that there. Now, why, why new heaven and new earth as the third angel arriving? Okay, so when I what, so what I have there is, I'm, that's a reform line, right? That is going to because uh, we haven't done that reform line, but I have. Um, so that's going to be dealing with uh, the seven last plagues. So, I mean, I could have I could have named it differently, but it's going to lead to that. Right. So this is going to be lead. It's going to culminate in the new heaven and the new earth. And, and I'm doing that because I'm paralleling with the beginning, with the creation of heaven and earth, which is our first reform line, uh, which is uh, the seven days of creation. So you're placing the cosmic line as a type of chiasm. Yes, it is a chiasm. And you can see the creation of heaven and earth, new heaven and new earth. You can see the flood in the Sunday law. And you can see, and, and the thing is, the door of the ark was closed on October 22nd, 2391 BC on the 10th day of the seventh month. And in Jeff's line, he would have October 22nd represent the Sunday law, right? And then we have literal and spiritual Israel on either side of the cross. Right. But now the question I'm going to ask is, 
is the application being made that the line for literal Israel is also a chiasm? Well, yeah, there is a chiasm that goes along here as well. And, and, and you should be able to easily see that. I mean, Christ, Israel's 12 sons and Christ and his 12 disciples. Right? Right at the beginning and the end. Well, I mean, it's literal to the left, spiritual to the right. Um, well, uh, it's going to end up ending on, you mean in the cosmic line it is. But here yeah. it's going to lead to uh, to the end of, because even when we look at Christ and his 12 disciples, I mean, there's going to be a bunch of reform lines in that one reform line or that one way mark, right? So I'm just contrasting Israel's 12 sons with the 12 disciples. So oh, I, I understand that part. Yeah. And, and, and what I could have done here with the three decrees um, is, you know, instead of Egypt to Canaan, uh, we could put, you know, Babylon to Jerusalem, you know, whatever. And then in 1097, this is when they get a king. Um, and in 742 BC, that's going to be the prophecy given uh, about um, uh, the pride of the power, right? So that it's, it's answering to Leviticus 26, verse 18, dealing with, I will break the pride of your power, make your heaven as iron and your earth as brass. So that prophecy is going to begin in 742, where it, it begins for, for, uh, Judah for um, southern Israel. It's going to set out the beginning of those, the fulfillment of Leviticus 26 for them. And then 977 BC, um, I put that at the center. And there's a number of reasons. I mean, it doesn't look like a cross. I mean, you just think about uh, the dividing of the kingdom. Um, but that's that's where I place that at the center. There's reasons uh, for that. So well, it's uh, this literal Israel is is also there is also a progressive destruction of four going on here as well. But this reform line is just trying to create this mirror. So we're going to have here when Solomon dies and. Um, so that's kind of lining up in a sense with Babylon has fallen, right? There's the kingdom becomes divided into two, and and there's other structural reasons. Um, the 235 years, then followed by the 235 months, things like that. But but when we went through this before, I mean, we we laid out these lines. We probably discussed some of these things. Not everything. That was in my mind that we discussed, but um, and not every single one of these lines necessarily is a chiasm. It's just that the the way that this is being presented, it it tends to lend itself to chiastic structure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I mean, one of the things we saw, too, was in the cosmic line, we did this, and we could clearly show the chiasms uh, here, how these things are connected uh, with the lampstand. With the menorah, yes. And uh, so so we can see that, that that exists pretty much in every one of these in some way. But some are much more obviously chiastic than others. But as I, I was thinking about it this morning, because uh, I got up at 2 a.m. Uh, thinking about these things. So I couldn't go back to sleep. I had to think about it more. So I got up. And... Um, so in, in moving ahead, because I started thinking about chapter 17. So chapter 17, 
and uh, you know we had gone over before 18 etc went through those chapters and you know those go back to the beginning right that is it goes the history really before all of these judges arise right but they put it at the end of the book of judges um so we took that as is kind of a repeat of history um but then I started thinking more about this, these overall structures and what we'd been doing with judges. So when we started with judges, you know, we didn't know that we were going to do everything that we did, right? We just got to chapter two. We saw that it went from 9-11 to 2023. And then we started going through it in detail. And then we went back over it and started drawing the lines for all these histories but we really hadn't placed it in any of these other lines that we had. So, um, so that was, you know, just my thinking there. We have literal Israel, but we don't have the judges, right? So this is, that was one when we went through that. Um, and, and we kept doing this as we kept going through these lines. We had Millerites line with our line, we dealt with the big line. Um, Miller, we looked at Miller and Moses, how they both have their personal reform lines. Um, we dealt with uh, the Exodus line itself, Egypt to the Promised Land, right? Um, Joshua conquering the land. And, I th and then we dealt with Jericho itself, had its own line. And this was Snow's line. And let me see the other one. So I think that was it as far as the lines that we drew for those. Yeah, we got into other things. So, so, um, so we never drew, drew out the judge's line, like the whole book of judges. And, and I think that that's going to be helpful for us um, as we try to finish off the book of judges. Does that make sense? Sounds logical. Okay. <clears throat> so I'm just going to copy one of these lines and, and do this here. New slide. So here we have a line. We're gonna we're gonna say judges line. So obviously all of this is gonna change. And and I I'm still arguing that judges is a progressive destruction of four. But um trying to understand that is um, when we look at the progressive destruction of four in, in Leviticus 26, because Leviticus 26 actually lays down that model uh, the four seven times. Uh, we know that there are reform lines that are occurring within that history. Right? Yes. And so, so with judges, what, what we're going to do is we're going to look at both of these lines. So we're going to look at the progressive destruction of four. So in doing that, we need to get just four way marks. So I'm just going to do like this. And then just spread these out. Probably could have just removed some of these, but anyway. Oops. Why is that happening? Oh, 
didn't work. Oh, I see. Okay, that's better. And then we'll move these over. Okay, so if we were going to look at a progressive destruction of four, what you're really looking at is four generations. So maybe I should have five way marks here. I'll do it this way. Or five lines. Because I need, I probably need four generations, but we're just going to have to imagine uh, that there, that the fourth is continuing. That's just the start of the fourth generation. So when does what? What do we have when we have? Um, because you're going to have a reform line, and so you're going to have here. Um, I should have done it this way right here. So what what would we have that that happens with the first gen? What what does the first generation mean? First generation of what? Would this be the first generation of those that entered into the promised land? Okay, right. So it's so it's after what? What what has happened? And because we we've they've entered into the promised land. So so we have this this period of the Exodus, this period in the wilderness. But then there's a reform line, right? right. So, so this is going to be Joshua's reform line. Okay. Okay. Um, now, Joshua spans the period of time from when they were, uh, because it's not going to be Moses that leads them out of the wilderness, right? It's Moses is going to lead them out of Egypt. Right. He's going to set up the laws, all of this, the, the whole Jewish economy, uh, the temple, all those things. Right. And we would parallel that to Millerite history. Correct. Moses is a major reform line that we connect to Millerite history as far as it's parallel. I would think that would be correct. Yeah, the glorious manifestation of the power of God. It's in 1533. Ellen White says, says from 1840 to 1844 is the glorious manifestation of the power of God. That's August 11th, 1840 to October 22, 1844, a period of 1533 days. So we can see those direct parallels. So, so after Moses, there is a new reformer. So, so who, who is Joshua paralleling? How has this movement addressed that in the past? Okay, if we're going to look at Millerite history, I mean, it, it's not necessarily as clear as, um, as sometimes we make it out because, I mean, we have Miller and then we have Snow. But Snow is going to lead us to October 22, 1844. But we sort of say that Miller does, right?
So, so just ask the question, would we parallel snow with Joshua or would we do something else? Or would we parallel Joshua with James White? I would almost think we'd be paralleling Joshua with James White. But snow could fit. Yeah. So snow could fit to some degree. Um, but in, in the Millerite history, uh, we have, because Joshua serves a role, um, obviously, leading them um, into the promised land, but he doesn't. He doesn't really have a role leading them out of Egypt. I mean, it's going to be after they get out of Egypt, you know, that Joshua is going to come in to, to play, right? So they've left Egypt. And, and we don't know if maybe he had some kind of role before, but I, there's nothing in the biblical record of it. But he's going to be Moses' assistant, Um, so all we can say, at least on, on the simple thing, the simple line is that we have, wherever we're going to mark the end of that reform line, whether we're going to mark it or who we're going to mark it with, uh, we know that we generally look at the death of Joshua as the end of uh, that period and begins the period of the judges, Right. That's how, how we would do it. We, we don't say the period of the judges starts with Joshua. Or do we? So what generally happens in the first generation? Like at, at the end of a reform line, we're going to have the first generation, the second, the third, the fourth. So what happens at the end of a reform line and we have the first generation? What, what characterizes it? Okay. Here's one thing that characterizes it. And what is this one thing that I just put there? So it's at the end of the reform line, after you have the third, right? So you'd have the third angel arrives from the previous reform line. Then you're going to have this four generations, so if you were looking at Millerite history, and this is, um, so I'm going to do it this way, third angel arrives. I'm going to put that there. Does that make sense to people? If we're looking at Millerite history, that's October 22, 1844. You're going to have a disappointment. Right? And then you're going to have the number seven. And so what's the number seven represent in Millerite history? So it's the Sabbath, right? Now, if we're going to deal with this reform line, because there's so many different reform lines, but when we went through the book of Joshua, um, they're going to enter into the promised land. I know we have Joshua's line somewhere. Um, but what's going to happen right after they enter into the promised land? So they, they cross the Jordan River on the 10th day of the first month, right?
Okay, so they cross the Jordan River. Then what happens? They set up a memorial, right? They're going to be circumcised. They're going to um, what else is going to happen? So they're gonna they're gonna keep the Passover, right? Gather the manna for the last time. They're gonna keep the feast of unleavened bread, and they're going to have. So where would we connect the number seven here in this story? Would it be the fall fall of Jericho? Okay. So, yeah. So, we're going to have the fall of Jericho. Um, now, we know that they're going to have the wave sheaf offering, and then there's going to be seven weeks to Pentecost. Um, and I don't remember exactly where we place all of the, these events, exact, you know, because we got the fall of Jericho, and I think it's going to happen shortly after they keep the Passover. But you're going to have them marching around uh, Jericho for seven days. And then the seventh day, they're going to march around seven times. So, they're, uh, so we can see that that's the... Do we parallel that in Millerite history after October 22nd, 1844? Would the parallel be the seventh month movement? No. Okay. No, we're going to have after October 22nd, 1844. Oh, excuse me. Excuse me. You're right. Yeah. So we have the rebuilding of Jericho, which would parallel the fall of Jericho. Right? Agreed. And and that rebuilding of Jericho, that's going to be connected with uh, 1863. So we can see that there's, you know, there's the Sabbath that comes along. There's going to be the study of the seven times, uh, seven years before 1863. You've got the seven weeks here of Pentecost. And then you also have Jericho. So we can see that it's not just one thing that is the seven. There's actually more. And they parallel each other. And, and so in that first generation, um, in Adventism, I mean, they're going to establish the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And so we would look at that, and we'd say, well, that's that's good, right? I mean, same thing happens after um, Ezra's first decree. There's going to be the second decree. They're going to build uh, the streets and the walls. They've established Jerusalem again. Well, that's a good thing. Except that we know a lot of the things that they did uh, the marriage to the foreign wives and the Sabbath, even though these were good things, uh, these things became perverted so that by the time you get to Christ, to the fourth generation, um, we have Jewish exclusiveness and legalism, particularly in regards to the Sabbath. And so things happen in this history that are under God's direction. But you still have a falling away that happens in the first generation. Christ establishes his church, right? He has the disciples who establish the church too, right? And yet we know that in that first generation that is represented by Ephesus, 
there still is a falling away. So, so that's going to happen. So if we look at the story of Judges, I mean, Judges begins basically dealing with the events at the death of Joshua and what's going to happen then in regards um, to what God has set up. And that, and that seems kind of, for, you know, when we look at it, we just had a reform line. So why are we having this falling away? But it's what happens in every, after every reform line. You're going to have four generations. And then you have another reform line. And that reform line becomes a major reform line. And so we, we put together this chains of progressive destructions of four, a reform line, progressive destruction of reform, a reform line. And these are going to give you all of your major reform lines. But it also happens even in the, the secondary reform lines. And even in the tertiary, you're going to find that often there's this progressive destruction of four. Now, it doesn't always happen in some of these smaller reform lines. You can't really distinguish exactly where the, the progression of the four generations is. Um, but, but these these happen in these reform lines. So in the period of Judges, we have this falling away. Now, we would take the story in Judges 17. So let's, let's go there. So when we go to Judges 17 and we deal with Micah and the Levite, and, and then you're going to go, of course, to chapter 18, 19, 20, and 21, you're going to have... Um, the story sort of progressing. You have the Levite and the concubine, and we connect these stories together. And then you're going to have this uh, civil war, so to speak, with Israel and the tribe of Benjamin. And then these the tribe of Benjamin being uh, provided with these um, wives. So, so there's all these things that happen here at the end. Um, and what was the reason that we believe that they're at the end? Why is, why is this history that really should precede the period of the judges, or the beginning of the period of the judges anyway, why is it placed at the end of the book of Judges? Was it confusion? What do you mean confusion? When they wrote the book? No, 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 no. Oh, okay. No, I mean the in the in these situations, there are when when the scrolls themselves were originally produced. Okay. Is it possible? Is it possible that this could have just been a a situation of confusion? I mean, with the translators. I don't think so. Okay. No, I think this is the way the book was meant to be written. Okay. Um, I mean, I, I can't prove it, but uh, there's there's reasons why I think that is. I mean, it just has to do with the way that the Book of Judges starts out i don't think you could take this story and just uh put it in place it there you know you couldn't just put it before because there's this continuity that goes on now part of the continuity that goes on at the beginning of the judges has to do with uh the results of them not completely conquering the land right so they so they didn't conquer the land completely and these enemies that are there are going to cause these problems. Initially, that's what the book of Judges is going to address, these different nations. I mean, first you actually have Babylon, and then you have uh, Moab, and then you have, um, I'm trying to remember everybody. I know the Philistines come in there, and they come again um, you know, later on as well. So they tend to be one of the main enemies uh, during that period of time. You also end up having some internal enemies 
that occur in these stories as well. Um, you know, so like Abimelech and so forth. Um, and the other guy, I can't think of his name. Uh, so, so you have this whole um, logical progression from the beginning of the book of Judges, and this just wouldn't fit in there. So that's one thing. I mean, it's the way it's written. You couldn't just say, well, it should have been placed here, literar literarily, right? Now, the other thing is, um, I think the purpose is to end the book of Judges with these stories. It's going to go back to these stories from earlier. So they're talking about there was no king. Now, why would they say there was no king and every man did that which was right in his own eyes? Because um, the question is then is when is the book of Judges or these last chapters of the book of Judges, when are they written then? Wouldn't they be written when they had a king, is the question. Or at least put together. I, I would think that your your thought there is correct, because it would give a, a clear um, demarcation that they're remembering the time when there was no king at a time when there was a king. Right. And, and this would also explain why they're placed at the end, because you have the story of the judges of what has happened. And now they're going to go back and tell these stories about something that had happened earlier in that history. Showing basically the evil that was existing. So these these are an example of the sins of Israel. That these last five chapters. And um, yet, th yet they serve a purpose as being a repeat of history. Right, and Judges is going to end off with this, you know, in those days there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. And chapter 17 uh, is going to, they're going to have that on verse 6. So they're going to start out this story and then they're going to mention uh, the same phrase. So that's going to be, it starts chapter 17, not right at the very first verse, but it ends off the book of Judges. So it's placing this these stories here at a time when there was no king. And, and it's an illustration of the evils that were happening during the period of the judges. So to me, that's, that's the logical way to understand this, why it's this way from a practical sense of how it, the book of Judges was put together. Um, but it also uh, serves a purpose as an illustration of our history. You know, we're not talking about a king in the literal sense, but this movement at the present time is not organized. And it's not just, you know, like it's not legally organized. I mean, it's it's in disarray, if we want to put it that way. So it's describing the spiritual condition of the movement at the present time. So, so we have in this book of Judges, we have, um, I mean, we have chapters that are out of order. The last five chapters, you know, in a sense are out of order, not in the right place historically, chronologically out of order, uh, but purposefully placed in that way. And uh, then we have all of these different nations that are going to, uh, so when they talk about it in chapter one, they're going to talk about um, uh, some of the 
ending up taking over the land. And then they're going to talk about uh, failure to complete the conquest. All right, so it gives the areas that they haven't really uh, conquered yet. And then it says, talks about this league with the inhabitants of the land. It warns against having a league. And, and then it says that after the death of Joshua, um, Israel is unfaithful and God has kept those enemies. Um, and, and I find this interesting too, Judges 2.14. The anger of the Lord was hot against Israel and he delivered them into the hands of spoilers that spoiled them. Now, when we deal with spoilers, what, what does this remind us of? I mean, not so much the word spoilers, because it, it can be translated differently. Could it be the robbers, ah! <clears throat> robbers of my people in Daniel eleven fourteen? 14? Right. So it's the robbers of thy people. Now, it's also spoilers which spoiled them. So it's the Romans. And and so one of the things that we we discussed as we went through this history, and this is going to be Judges 2, 14, and I believe this is 2014. Right. So this is going to be about Parminder and his uh, prediction. Now, in 2014, um, Parminder hasn't worked his way completely back into the movement, but he's going to start uh, back into the movement at this time. So he has these couple of years where he's because once he made the prediction about 2014, um, then he's going to have you know, be labeled uh, by Jeff as fanatic. Uh, but in 2014, he starts to make the moves to come back into the movement. So by 2016, he's going to be ordained as an elder and put in charge of the organization of the movement. And, um, and there's going to be this conflict, of course, going on with uh, when that happens uh, with um, Mark Bruce, so the conflict intensifies and Mark Bruce's movement's going to leave basically out of jealousy from Parminder being put into place. Because I don't think Mark Bruce really understood what, because nobody did, uh, what Parminder was going to do. So Parminder just maneuvered his way in a position that he could be accepted by the movement, by Jeff, and made an elder. And then it's going to take him, once he feels secure in that position, to start to uh, indoctrinate uh, the people in the movement under Jeff's nose. So, um, yeah. Well, so the hands of the spoilers, Parminder. So there's there's two things happening in 2014. So we have a whole bunch of people leave the movement. All of these different uh, ministries are going to leave the movement. Uh, Path of the Just and the other ones can't think of the names of the different movements and churches that had had joined under the 2520. And um, in 2013, that's when we're going to have, because uh, uh, it's the end of the Habakkuk's Two Tables series uh, that uh, Emiliana was supposed to present, and he was going to present Ezra 7-9. He ended up being too sick. And um, when Jeff came in August to Alberta in 2013, he mentioned this not in one of his studies, but just uh, as a question, did anybody have any information regarding the first day of the fifth month? And Jeff had just said, you know, there's going to be 120 days from the first day of the first month uh, to the first day of the fifth month, and then 70 days from the first day of the fifth month to the 10th day of the seventh month. And I told him that's not correct because the months aren't actually 30 days. They average out to 29 and a half. So some, some are 29, some are 30. And so, so I did the, the calculation there at that time and figured out when uh, first day of the fifth month was. Um, and then the next year in 2014, you're going to have um, Noel do a presentation on it. Uh, so he figures it out as well and gets it correct. And then we have, um, uh, so I, I do in 2014, I first present chronology to the movement. Uh, 
um, because I didn't do that in 2013. I was presenting the seven times. Uh, 2014, though, I, I work out the chronology to some degree and do presentations on that, all these structures. And um, so we have all of these different things happening in 2014, people leaving the movement, um, but Parminder coming in and, and basically, uh, without those pe people leaving the movement, uh, Parminder could not have come in as he did. Because if, you know, if Emiliano and Jamal and all these people had stayed in the movement, um, you really wouldn't have had room for Parminder. Um, and so Parminder starts to come in, but you also are going to have uh, Mark Bruce coming in at that time. Mark Bruce is going to be at the camp meeting in 2014 in Alberta. Uh, he wasn't there in 2013, but he was in 2014. And um, and then I see Parminder in 2015. He comes to Alberta. So that's the first time I meet him. But I knew of him uh, more his brother, actually, than him, uh, Manjit. Um, but I met Parminder in 2015 when he came to Alberta. And, and um, so, so this 2014, anyway, we're, we're going a little bit off track. But... The idea here is that these spoilers, this is Roman. I mean, if you're going to look at anything about Parminder, it's definitely Roman philosophy, right? I mean, this comes really straight from the thinking of the papacy. And there's a lot of difference between just being a good, pe a good teacher and having people think. Uh, but Parminder was more a deconstructionist than a teacher. Would you agree with that? I can't disagree with you, Anna. I mean, let's, if we look at this very directly. Yeah. Is Parminder advocating following God's law? Is he is he advocating following the word of God? Well, on the surface he is. Okay, but you know, initially, right? Okay, that's initially. Yeah. But when it came to Germany. With everything that was going on over there. Well, yeah, they're not following the word of God by then. Okay. Now, consider consider this brief passage from the Spirit of Prophecy. Mm -hmm. This can be found in Manuscript 28 of 1900. Paragraphs 1 through 4. And they're, they're just very brief. The Lord Jesus represents the whole of heaven's treasures, which have been committed to him to impart to the church in rich, full currents of love, grace, and power. If an earthly father being evil gives his hungry child bread and not a stone, a fish and not a serpent, will God being good and righteous deny his children the gift of the Holy Spirit? Upon his children, he bestows his blessings abundantly. The Lord's hand is not shortened, that it cannot save. Neither is his ear, ear heavy, that it cannot hear. Isaiah 59.1 The reason why the churches do not understand the word of God is given in the 58th chapter of Isaiah. In this chapter are laid down the conditions of receiving God's blessings. If thou take away from the midst of these the yoke, the putting forth of the finger, and speaking vanity. If thou draw out thy soul to the hungry, and satisfy the afflicted soul, then shall thy light rise in obscurity, and thy darkness be as the noonday. And the Lord shall guide thee continually, and satisfy thy soul in draught, and make fat thy bones, and thou shalt be like a watered garden, like the springs of water, whose waters fail not. 
and they that be of thee shall build the old waste places and shall rise up the foundations of many generations, and thou shalt be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of the paths to dwell in. If thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord, honorable, and shall honor him, and not doing thine own ways, nor finding thine own pleasure, nor speaking thine own words, then shalt thou delight thyself in the Lord, And I will cause thee to ride upon the high places of the earth and feed those, feed thee with the heritage of Jacob, thy father, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. Isaiah 58 verses 9 through 14. If men would receive the word of God, just as it reads, power from on high would be given them. Instead of working against God by their disobedience, they would seek to win souls to obedience. And and so we can see clearly with Parminder. um, So he's not, and and see, this is a, there's, maybe it looks like a subtle difference, but there's actually quite a big divide between what we are doing in studying and examining things in such detail and the way Parminder was, um, you know, parsing the spirit of prophecy, so to speak, right? So he was he was actually undermining both the Bible and the spirit of prophecy and how he studied. But it looked like on the surface, like he was just doing detailed study. But I found time and time again, things that he was saying, uh, I couldn't support by the scriptures, and, and just little things, like even his study dealing with um, uh, Daniel chapter 2 and uh, the clay. I don't know if people remember that study. But uh, he, w- he was going off track. He would get some things that would be, you know, insightful but other things that were definitely not in agreement with the scriptures. And, and I just looked at it as, well, you know, he's, he's just making mistakes. People make mistakes. We all do. But later on, I saw what he was specifically doing was this type of deconstructionism. So, and, and people may not know what I mean by deconstructionism, uh, but this is the idea um, where um, it, it is sort of a type of uh, uh, metaphysics as well. Um, so it has to do with understanding the re- difference between the text and what it means. So if we take God's word as it's, as it's written, right? As Ellen White says, if men would receive the word of God just as it reads... A deconstructionist doesn't do that. Correct. Right. So now somebody could say that we are doing deconstructionism as we we make these various applications of scripture. But one of the things that, that we have to really distinguish is that when we take the word of God, we can never have it contradict itself. We can't, we can't, you know, find a deeper meaning of a scripture that contradicts a plain thus saith the Lord. Right? So every time we study into the word and we go, we go deep and we see these different layers. It already agrees with what we it agrees with what we already understand, correct? That's that's the way correct. that I understand it. Yeah. So um so this this idea that we can get the scriptures to say sort of the opposite of what they're saying, um, I don't think that we can do that. 
Now, some people would take, you know, when we take, for instance, the story of, of Esther, and we say, well, you know, Esther in the story, I mean, she's, she's really doing things she shouldn't be doing. I mean, she's in Babylon still. She's also going to, you know, hide her identity, uh, become the wife of a king, uh, you know, a pagan king, all these different things. Um, and even Mordecai, you know, I mean, he's in Babylon. Shouldn't he be in Jerusalem already? They've already, uh, you know, had the call to go back to Jerusalem, uh, you know, twice under uh, Cyrus's decree and under Darius's. So, you know, we can say, well, and, you know, Vashti morally is superior to Esther. But yet we know that Esther represents the three angels' messages. Vast. Vashti and being disobedient to her husband symbolically is 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 in the in the wrong right so when we look at the whole story and take it as a symbol and so some people could argue well you know you're not taking the plain meaning of the text um, you, you're finding hidden meaning and it goes contrary to what it appears like on the surface but but we know that this is in accordance with the scriptures I mean you nobody can argue that Samson is not a type of Christ, and yet it's a morally ironic story that all the things that have happened before time were happened for our learning. That there's there's no way that we can say you you can't take the stories of the scriptures and see these parallels, and that uh, and in doing so, we sometimes we don't ignore the moral lessons. We see what they are. But we see that they're also illustrating things. And so, so it, this is an important point, I think, when it comes to understanding what's happening in our study. So when we're putting these things on a line in the way that we are, and we're looking at something like Judges 2, verse 14, and we're saying that this is, this is the enemy that has come into this movement. I mean, that's really the main thing that we've seen, is that there is... A, a way of thinking that is error. Now, one of the things you'll see, and, and I've seen this my whole life, so I noticed this when I was younger. So um, people don't know everything. So when I was a kid, you know, and I went to school, um, I read a lot. And my teachers would say things that were wrong all the time, um, you know, because I read, you know, I read science and they would make statements that I knew, well, that's not true. Um, so I, I never did. I was always very skeptical of any any information that came to me. So that means I, I needed to examine uh, if, if something was important. I heard some information. One is I, I didn't like to share information that I wasn't sure of. Um, cause I thought that was lying. Right. So I, I was very sensitive about being untruthful. Um, and, and also I wanted to know what was correct. And, and so that, that's kind of served me well in becoming a Christian and becoming a seventh day Adventist. I want to know, is this correct? Is not correct. I didn't just accept something because somebody says it. Um, so, when we um, you know so when we start to examine the scriptures, we're looking for truth, and God's word is the source of all truth. So the spoilers that have spoiled us, are those, is this system of Roman teaching? And Roman teaching is what? How would we describe Roman teaching? It would be accepting what? The words of men over the word of God? Definitely. Okay. So we, we have the problem, though, that, that many conservative Adventists take and even other types of Adventists, but 
you know, we don't, we recognize the dangers of higher education, right? What, what the world calls higher education. And we know that God has a different system of higher education. That's learning in the school of Christ. Um, and so we can be sort of skeptical of, you know, those proud, um, you know, teachers or theologians or professors or scientists or whatever. But are we any different when we just believe anything we read on the Internet that agrees with our sentiments? Not really. Not really, no. Um, you know, there may be people who say, well, you know, I don't believe the scientists and they tell us, you know, the, the earth is a sphere, but I believe it's, it's flat because it appears flat to me. Um, you know, and I've, I've dealt with flat earthers. Now, because I understand astronomy and I understand how sunrise and sunsets work and, and different models and, you know, the fact that uh, uh, the sky rotates in the northern hemisphere, you know, counterclockwise and in the southern hemisphere clockwise. Uh, I mean, I can tell you that the earth is a sphere and that there's no flat earth model that can explain what we we see, um, you know, it can't explain sunrise, sunsets. And I've looked at the models. So, you know, I've spent a lot of time because I've studied flat earth since I was like 10 years old. So um, long before it was ever fashionable. So I looked at it because I had a friend who was a flat earther and a very smart guy too. Um, so, you know, I've looked at things critically. So when somebody, you know, I read something, you know, it tells me, oh, here's some kind of life hack. You know, you can, you know, use onions to collect um, uh, germs or something in there. Put a, an open onion or something. Or, you know, you shouldn't eat this because of whatever reason and so forth. Well, you know, I don't just accept something that somebody says. And so, you know, we can't be gullible. Everything that we believe has to be based upon, first, God's word. It has to be based upon principles that are established and also upon obedience to God's word. So we need to obey God and we need to be critical of anything that especially goes contrary to God's word. And what we have had in this movement is a lot of truth mixed with error, right? So we have to sort the precious from the vile. And that's what this, these enemies that are in this movement is Roman thought and Greek thought, because Roman thought is really Greek thought. Correct? Agreed. Yeah. So we, we've looked at the judges as messages from God to correct our understanding. That's primarily how we understood the judges, especially the first part of the judges where you have these external enemies. But then we see that they shift to these internal enemies. Sometimes there's external enemies as well, but God's people are also fighting against the truth. And so we have this, so these civil wars, so to speak, uh, that are existing in the period of the judges. Right? So in... <clears throat> 2.16, it says, nevertheless, the Lord raised up judges, which delivered them out of the hand of those that spoiled them. And so what arose in 2016? What was the judge that arose in 2016 to deliver us from the hand of, the, of those that spoiled us?
because 2016 is, is an important year. And we have an important truth that this movement uh, came to understand in 2016. Wasn't generally understood in 2016. So in 2013, as I said, you know, I first introduced chronology into the movement. Well, God did, you know, but I was the one studying it. But in 2016, Stephen and I were at the School of the Prophets, and we discovered a lot of things. So one is was the understanding of, and, and you're going to see that, you know, first in 2015, we have some understanding of things as well. So there's this foundation being laid, but 2016... What is it that we're going to discover? It's going to be the connection between the book of Ezekiel and Revelation 9 because of chronology. And so that understanding is going to develop into the understanding of July 18. Samuel Snow's letters is going to be the next piece of the puzzle in 2017. But when we finally get to 2019, um, we have information that shows us that what Parminder is teaching is error, particularly in connection with his time setting. And Parminder is going to reject July 18. Now, do, do people know why he rejects July 18? So in 2019, you know, they're going to present November 9th in 2018. But in 2019, why does Parminder reject July 18? How does he reject it? Does he make any arguments against it? Anybody know? I don't recall. Okay. He makes no arguments against it. He doesn't try to show why it's error. He just declares it to be error based upon his authority. Right? It's what, August, uh, August 29th, he's going to bring uh, Odilio, John Mark, and um, Stephen before his tribunal and, and say, basically, you have to recant. Does he listen to any arguments? Does he present any arguments? No. No. Right. It's just basically, we have decided that this is error. That all truth comes through us. The test is the prophet. Uh, Theodore is uh, Simon Magus. He's a magician. He's tricking you. But nobody's going to examine it. Is that according to uh, how Christ would do things? Is that according to the scriptures? And then we're going to have the same thing happen on December 6, 2020. Are they actually examining and trying to understand um, what happened with July 18th when they deliver their declaration? No. No. They do the same thing basically that Parminder did, and it is they attack the messenger. Right? Agreed. So, so this is something that comes from Rome. Right? 
this, this authority of man. And we can never do that again. The authority comes from God's word. Everything that we believe must be founded upon God's word. Not because somebody said it, you know, because we, we like this person or, you know, we, you know, whatever reasons people have. We know that God is the one in charge. He's leading it. We're not following any men. And, and we live in a time when there is no king. And every man does what's right in his own eyes. Can God's people survive in that environment? Because who's to be our king? None but Christ. And are we to be organized under Christ? Yes. Not under man, not under any organization that we can do. Doesn't mean that we don't have order. Right. We need to do things orderly. Um, but we are being called to something that Israel, ancient Israel was called to when there was a theocracy set up. And so we are to obey Christ. And we are to cooperate with our brethren. We are to act in the meekness and the lowliness of Christ. And and so this whole story of the period of the judges, if we're going to you know, really place it on a line, and we're going to see it as a progressive destruction of four, um, we should be able to see what the darkness is and what the reform line that follows the period of the judges is about. So it sort of relates to our studies of the lines that we're doing in our simplicity of the lines, but this is understanding the lines too. So anyway, that's kind of what we're going to do next week. So we, we've sort of, I mean, we're going to come back to chapter 17. We're going to look at a lot of other details. Uh, but I think we need to create this framework for judges in this progressive destruction of four. And then um, uh, show how it also fits into a reform line. So it's going to do both. Any final thoughts before we close with prayer? Okay, let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we are very grateful for all that you do. And for the time that we have had here this week, we pray for your continued presence throughout the weekend coming up, Friday night study, and the studies on Sabbath, uh, the studies on Sunday morning and in the afternoon. Um, we need you to instruct us and teach us. Forgive us our sins and help us to, to depend upon you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.